Madden is the only broadcaster ever that would keep fans watching during a blowout. Exactly right. How did this start, the project? This started through two people who you know, Eric Shanks, who you just referred to, our, our biggest boss who runs the network, and Richie Zions, who is the lead game producer on the Aikman and Buck crew. Each worked on John's crew. And John, at 85 now, they each wanted a tribute, Colin, a documentary that could really sort of put in place and tell the story, take us on the journey through John's incredible life and the reach he's had in all these different ways as a coach, as a broadcaster, as a pitch man, as a pop culture icon, in all these different facets in which he touched the different stages of American life. That's what shaped the project. So he called and said, I'm interested in doing this. It's the first time Fox Sports in-house has produced a documentary like this. And we're we're thrilled that this is the subject and that Christmas Day is when it premieres. When you um, talk to athletes about Madden, um, his significance in their life, if you could, Aikman, Manning, that John would talk about you. 38 interviews. Look at it this way. Not a single person said no. Every single request we made, the subject said, John Madden, yeah. Lawrence Taylor, who's the first voice you will hear in the documentary, who does virtually nothing, yeah. said, I-, I really don't do much for the league. I really don't do much for the Giants. Oh, oh, it's John Madden? Yeah. When and where? I'll do it. Brady, Lamar, Patrick Mahomes, the coaches, the broadcasters, and what we think are perhaps the most important voices, Colin, Virginia, his wife, who really hasn't sat for an extensive interview, and his his sons, Mike and Joe. Um, what was the first surprise of the, of the process? When he first leaves coaching, he's a young man. He gets to 100 wins faster than anyone ever has. That's right. And he teaches a class at Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> in football at Cal Berkeley. And just because at heart, and I think this permeates <clears throat> the entire documentary, Colin, John is a teacher. He taught when he coached. He then took that into broadcasting. He took that into the video game and its development. Mm-hmm. He wanted to teach all that he thought the game could deliver. And I think that permeates everything he's done. Um, was he surprised, do you think, by his success? Very much so. He had very little regard or respect for broadcasters. There's an anecdote that one of his sons tells. After a game, Howard Cosell walks past after a Monday night broadcast, sees John out of the corner of his eye and says, hey, great show tonight. A game that John's team had lost. And it was all John could do to contain himself. (laughs) He wanted to rip him limb from limb. You're talking about what kind of show? We're out here living and dying about this. This isn't a show. He he called them hairdos. That's what he thought of people. (laughs) Production meetings didn't exist before John Madden. No one met with the coaches or the players. No one attended practice. He's the person who first made that happen. He completely changed the way the game was broadcast, not only from the booth, but how it was broadcast from the truck. He's also the only person to work for all four networks and be that coveted. Would he be, I know the answer, but I want to hear you tell the story. Would he be effective today? Absolutely. And I think for one clear reason that you guys talk about a lot on this show, because he's authentic. There's only one version of John Madden. And I think that's what permeated his teams when he coached, that toughness, what he demanded, the accountability and clarity, the teaching, again, that he delivered. And it's why he resonated so beautifully with players and with coaches when he went to the broadcast booth. There there wasn't multiple versions of John. That was the version. And players and coaches gravitated to that. I think he would do very well. I think think he would think, I don't like maybe that the game is a little softer than when he coached, in his view. Uh, Although, he listen, he served on the competition committee. He's been a part of the safety panel. He's somebody that Goodell has called frequently, even after he retired. He's still involved because he just he loves the game. I may be wrong here, um, but I I recall John as a coach. 
being in my mid fifties, I remember. What do you see when you see that picture? What do you see? Well, the first thing I remember is a lot of movement. John moved a lot. John was very expressive. He emoted a lot. Uh, he also wore his sideline pass. Even after he'd become <laughs> one of the most successful coaches in the league, he, the pass would, it would flap around in the breeze. I remember hearing a broadcaster say of John Madden's teams, he only has one rule, don't sit on your helmet. Now, that may have been, it may be somebody else, but that sticks to me. I remember, you know, it's, it's really powerful to me. As a young kid growing up, I remember the 4 o'clock games and the Dolphins and the Raiders and the Steelers. And they, they always felt like Oakland was playing at home. And Madden was there, and it was Stabler, and it was Hendricks, and it was Mark Van Egan. And they were. this is why I think John would work today. Wild personalities. Rebels. And they loved John. And we talk about that authenticity. John said someone described him, a writer at some point, as looking like an unmade bed <laughs> on the sideline. And he said, well, yeah, that pretty much fits. That's who I am. That when he went out there and wildly gesticulated and screamed at officials and yelled at players, there was still a joy at core. Yeah. And always a teaching. Um. <sighs> Who did John, so many look up to John, did John have mentors? Were there people in his life that were, were powerful, seminal voices? There were, and I, he, he was reluctant to point out any one coach that helped shape him more than someone else, but the person that he worshipped was Vince Lombardi. That was the person that he wanted to emulate most. And what's most interesting is as you talk to today's coaches, the coaches that we interviewed, the uncommon closeness that they still feel to John, and they still talk with him. Bill Belichick, Andy Reid. I mean, Bill Belichick, we asked for half an hour in the interview with him, half an hour. At the 29-minute mark, we stopped, and we thanked Bill Belichick. He did not move. And it occurred to us, and to me, slow learner in the room, Unless, of course, Bill, there's something more <laughs> you'd like to share. And he went on for probably another 18 to 20 minutes talking about John. Wow. Is there an anecdote, um, maybe a Belichick anecdote? Because I've, I've always felt that Bill is fascinating when he's engaged. He is. And, whether, and I've been fortunate enough to have some of those moments of engagement with him because I'm typically not going there to ask him about the upcoming game. The Bengals. Right. Yeah, right, right. I mean, I'm asking Cincinnati. about John Madden. Yeah. I'm asking him about the origin of his relationship with Nick Saban, uh, things of that nature. Uh, so uh, I'm asking about the Naval Academy. So the, he's been wonderful to, uh, toward me and the crews that, that I've been a part of whenever I've visited with him. The reverence that each man has for one another. And one of the things that Madden says is, you think you know something, and then you have these moments in life when you meet someone who really knows it and how humbling that can be. And that was John's description of Bill Belichick's knowledge of football history. John said, I prided myself on thinking I knew a lot about football. And then I met Bill Belichick. Wow. And I understood that's a historian of the game. Why did he leave football? Was it the travel fear? No. That he, was my guest this morning to you off air. Right. I, so, I, so re real quickly, people know, mo most folks know, John didn't fly. He initially traveled by train after he left the NFL. Mm -hmm. And then he bought the bus, Dolly Parton's old tour bus. <laughs> There's endless stories, of course, <laughs> right? You can imagine if that bus could talk. Um, and the real core of his fear was claustrophobia, Colin. That's what he hated. He didn't like feeling as a big man, like he was pinned down and tight in on these planes. And then that fear was amplified by one terribly turbulent flight where almost in cliche form, not to minimize it, John offered the prayer up to above. If you get me through this, I'm never going to fly again. He landed safely. He never flew again. That is the, a bit of the origin of why. But as for why he left coaching, um, <clears throat> I think Virginia, in a way, says it powerfully, saying, you know, that 
all coaching takes from somebody. John had achieved what he had wanted to achieve, and he didn't equivocate. One of the first things we did, we built a large video screen in John's own uh, sound stage. He owns a production company in Northern California in Pleasanton, and we flashed moments of his life and asked him to sit and watch them and have us record his reaction. The very first thing we showed him was his retirement press conference, which he had not seen in decades. Film of it. How he sounded, how he looked, how hollowed out. And he said without equivocation, I'm not resigning, I'm not, I'm retiring, and I'm never going to coach again. And he never did. Was he an instant success as a broadcaster, day one? He would tell you absolutely not. And there's a great anecdote in the documentary. His screen test, Colin, of all things. Now explain what screen is to to uh, our audience. Sure. So so the screen test, if you will, in this case, we're going to go to a game. You're going to call it, but it's not going to go home. You're just going to call it for executives to judge. We do this all the time at Fox. Greg Olson, Mark Sanchez, that we see people paraded in. It's a test. You do a real game with a broadcaster. But, but in this case, they're actually there. He and his play-by-play partner who come, the, the play-by-play partner comes to pick him up. John beholds this man and looks at him and thinks, wow, I mean, this is the guy? This kind of little guy? And the guy doesn't seem too commanding or... Anyway, John gets in the car with him. They drive. They go to the top of the Coliseum, and they call a game which does not go home. They just call it for practice, a screen test. All of a sudden, they come on for the open, and the guy is commanding and poetic and authoritative, and John looks at him like, oh, my God, you're the guy? (laughs) Bob Costas was the guy. And, and so Costas is great telling the story, saying, you know, standing next to John, I kind of felt like I could sit on his knee like a puppet <laughs> because of my size versus his size. And they remain very good friends to this day. And uh, he, John was known as a very tough negotiator with networks. Um, that was kind of legendary when I got into the business. Uh, sure. there, stories about John. He, he would go to the presidents and say, listen, I know my value. Similarly, did that in his um, – uh, video game. Uh, he 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 was the first rich coach of our time. Um, when John left broadcasting, um, much like coaching, was he done with it, or or did a little bit of being in that stadium? Did did he miss that? Do you think? Two things there. So this Sunday, I'm sure John will be on that sound stage in Pleasanton, watching a video screen, a, a video wall of nine screens, watching every game that he can, sitting with invited guests, enjoying and watching. He lives it, he breathes it, he loves it. To circle back to your point about him as a negotiator, we had the opportunity to sit down with Rupert Murdoch (laughs) and talk about the negotiation with John. And one of the things that Rupert Murdoch said, not only did the network exist largely because John Madden decided to come here to validate the fact that we had gotten the NFL and we were going to have Pat Summerall and John Madden. One of the great lines in the documentary comes from Rupert who says, when I travel, if, if I talk about America or Americans, if I could introduce somebody to try to demonstrate or embody what an American is to someone who had never met someone from America, I would introduce him to John Madden. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) That really is. Um, I can't wait to watch it. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple other questions here because I get you so infrequently. Uh, Tom Rinaldi, it is... You can get me any time because you already know this, and so does Joy. I listen listen all the time. Well, but to get you in person, I feel so fortunate. I want to ask you about a couple people. Um, Coach K is retiring. Yeah. You've had many interviews and moments with Coach K. Um, does one stick out to you? It does, but it does not come from K. It comes from Mickey, his wife. Yeah. Uh, all the way back to terribly to date myself here, all the way back at the turn of the millennium, Time Magazine had a series of America's Best, and they picked Coach K as America's Best Coach. And in affiliation with CNN, SI, who I was working for at the time, I interviewed Coach K and I interviewed his wife and other people in his life. 
and his wife in describing what it was like to be married to him. <clears throat> I'll never, ever forget this. And I was not yet married at the time. And she said, you know, some days there is no love, but there's always commitment. God, I love that. And that is how she described him as well as a coach, that he was always committed. He deeply loved all his players. It may not show every day. That's right. But his commitment to them showed every day. Uh, you have, I, I would say, Nick Saban trusts you as much as any uh, person in the media in America. You have a very special relationship. Surprise me. What don't I know about Nick? Uh, there's so many different anecdotes. We had the chance to go back for Big Noon kickoff and sit down and mm -hmm. talk to him a little bit about this season, but ask him to tell a couple of the stories that he'd shared over the years. And I just think there's a lot about him that people don't know. Here's one thing in case people missed it. He grew up in West Virginia, coal mining country, yes. and his father was a real taskmaster. His mm -hmm. father ran a midget football team and league that his father had created, bought a small bus to round up kids to play, etc. I asked Nick, when's the last time you were in a coal mine? He said, I could tell you exactly when. I was in eighth grade, and I was in music class. And one of the assignments was that you had to stand up in front of the class and sing. And I refused. I would not do it. And I got a D. I came home with the D. My father said to my mother, take his basketball uniform, fold it up and give it to him because he's turning it in and his basketball season's over. And tomorrow you're getting up in the morning and coming with me. His father ran a filling station. Yes. But he knew coal miners. He went to a coal mine early in the morning and he asked, take him down to the bottom. And he went down to the bottom. Oh, Lord. With his dad. And his dad said, look around. If you don't value your education, if your grades don't matter to you, get used to this. This is the life you're going to lead. Wow. He never, ever stepped foot in a coal mine again. And I give you 50 more. He's a fascinating, fascinating guy. And I think, you know, people are amazed at his longevity. He loves recruiting. And I actually think in its own way, Colin, COVID and last season extended Nick's career because it saved a little wear on the tread of the tire. He, he could recruit remotely and do a few more things remotely. And I think he also got a little taste of maybe – Life at home is great, but I love the office and the field, too. Goes back to that love commitment thing. Uh, one more question. Um, your relationship with Tiger Woods is remarkable. Um, I saw him playing with his son, Charlie. And Did you uh, see the video? It's just breathtakingly funny and poignant and amazing. <laughs> How great is that? Um, I thought as I heard tiger remark that he'll you know never be on the tour again and yeah. i thought boy he is in a short list of greatest i've ever seen personal piccadillo's issues returns wins the masters i can't contain myself watching it and it's over kind of it is a arc like very few arcs why was that moment for each of you I can't tell you the number of people who said to me it was the most emotional sporting moment when he won the Masters they had ever seen. Miracle on Ice has won. Okay. Tiger Masters too. Why? Boy, I'd have to let that bake. Um, I like vulnerable people. Mm. He was just so beat up, right? Why for you? I just think there had been so much doubt <clears throat> that he would ever be able to come back. So many things had to happen. And of course, he had to master his circumstance competitively in those four days, and he summoned it. But, you know, I've heard Joyce say this a bunch of times. I think it's so true. We, I don't know what the impulse is with us. When we, when we build someone up, there's also a big part of us that seeks the fall. And listen, in don't, Tiger's don't pull away too far from us. We right. like you close. Yeah. We, we, we like you a little close. Oprah and the weight. Right. Right. So 
I think what, what Tiger has gone through, um, you know, much of it at his own doing, and yet he remains among the most compelling people on the face of the earth. I mean, people are compelled by him, everything he does. And so they are here as he goes and he plays with Charlie now. I mean, the last time I, I don't uh, text Tiger very often. I'm judicious with it, but I, I texted him certainly a handful of times through this year, through the recovery. Last time I texted him was on Thanksgiving. And I know one of the early sets of texts we shared was about the drive that served him so maniacally in competition, how that has served him in a more you can make the case a far more important way now to return to be able to do things as a man and a father that he so desperately wants to do, like this weekend. Yeah. What a pleasure. Uh, we don't get 30-minute guests often. We, uh, I don't think I've, I've had one in uh, a year, and that's how much uh, Tom Rinaldi means to us. I just love having you here as part of the company. Thank you, Colin. I'm, you know me. I'm the hugest fan there is of you. I just think you're singular. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.